Good morning. Welcome back to the continuity, continuation, continuance of the symposium. The theme which started yesterday on modernisms and sexualities continues into today. Um, and we have two talks and a panel. So we expect people will be dropping in over time given classroom schedules, distances, etc. So we hope it will be a fruitful and interesting. Ragu got locked out. This is side lights kind of thing. Okay. Um, so over to Meenakshi now. So welcome all. Thank you, sir. So uh, today we'll be continuing with the second thematic cluster for the symposium, which is uh, modernities and sexualities in Indian writing in English. We've already met two of our speakers in the cluster. Uh, Professor Karen Gabriel, who presented a lecture on the iconography of Bharat Mata yesterday morning in a postgraduate class. In the afternoon, uh, we had a lecture by Professor Meena Pillai, who spoke uh, about the definitions and interpretations of masculinities through from Gandhi Nehru, Aurobindo, all the way to Amish Tripathi. Uh, today, continuing on with uh, this thematic cluster, we have with us Dr. Brinda Bose. Dr. Brinda Bose has taught literature in Delhi for over 25 years and she currently teaches at JNU earlier at the De University of Delhi. Her in areas of interest for teaching and research are gender, sexualities, global modernisms and the avant-garde, modern and contemporary Indian writing and cinema, feminist queer studies and humanities studies. She's the editor of Humanities Provocator towards a contemporary political aesthetics and her monograph, The Audacity of Pleasure, Sexualities, Literature and Cinema in India was published in 2017. She has edited Amita Ghosh, Critical Perspectives, Translating Desire and Gender and Censorship. She has co-edited Interventions, Dialogues on Third World Women's Literature and Film and The Phobic and the Erotic, The Politics of Sexualities in Contemporary India. She has done critical editions of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, and Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. She is currently putting together a two-volume collection of archival and critical material on avant-garde aesthetics in India, which spans literature, cinema, art, photography, dance, and theater, and is working towards a monograph on the global avant-garde. Today, she'll be speaking on teaching Indian modernisms. May I invite Dr. Brinda Bose to please present her lecture. Hello everyone. Uh, can I still be heard if this is higher up? Can you hear me? This is fixed, right? Yeah. I prefer to stand actually. Can if you can hear? I can hold that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure actually to be back in um, at the University of Hyderabad where I spent uh, a lovely couple of weeks many years ago, I can't remember which year that was, um, visiting uh, the department and uh, meeting students, uh, students who would be well out of here by now, of course. Um, but it's great to be back and uh, thank you to, uh, to Minakshi, first of all, who have troubled with lots of emails. And, uh, and to promote and Anna for organizing this. Um, so uh, I'm going to start, yeah, thanks. Uh, is that it? Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, my pa uh, paper this morning, I'm not going to actually concentrate on uh, sexualities per se, since we have a panel discussion uh, in the afternoon anyway, where we'll be addressing that. So mine is a more general um, kind of take on uh, teaching Indian modernisms, which I've been doing 
uh, for a while, especially since I, you know, there were you know sections of of papers um, when I used to teach at uh, Delhi University and and also MPhil courses. But uh, at JNU, because we can you know sort of organize our own course um, lists, uh, so I have actually been doing modernism as a paper uh, for a while uh, as a course and uh, including. Uh, which actually looks at both Western and Indian uh, modernisms together. So it is a commonplace now that there is no single modernism in the world, but rather that there are multiple modernisms located at various cross points of latitude and longitude on the globe. But nor is there a single Indian modernism, despite the single geographical entity that is connotated in the naming of the country. There is also no clear demarcation of the end of modernism as a movement in literature because it has lived on in its abundant and vibrant afterlives all over the world. And really afterlives is what I, uh, uh, what I address because uh, the years of modernism are uh, often in, in dispute. I mean, when did it start? We often go by 1910, right? Um, but when did it end? We are not quite sure. Uh, and so a classroom in which this encounter with modernisms at large and in multiples is enacted, even when focused on India, must, it seems to me, be broken down into an understanding of modernisms in combat and in fragments, brimful of infinite and incomplete possibilities. When I went to college in Calcutta to study English literature a few decades ago, uh, modernism as we studied it in the classroom was a movement largely of the Western world or what is today called the Global North. This would probably have been true until the 1990s when non-Western texts began to formally enter undergraduate syllabi in, uh, in a lot of uh, places in India. When I first began teaching at Hindu College at Delhi University, um, this was in the late 1990s, a new syllabus that was adopted soon after I joined had exciting new Indian texts, both in English and in translation. A paper titled 20th Century Indian Writing that I partly taught had two novels besides selections of poetry and drama. The novels were Rabindranath Tagore's Ghore Baire, in translation as uh, The Home and the World, and Amitabh Ghosh's Shadow Lines, The Shadow Lines. For a while, I had the pleasurable task of doing both in the classroom, in a lost leisurely time of the annual system, which allowed a year with a single text if you so wanted it, or at least a half year. I recall that I spent a number of classes on the partition of the East, on the East, an unknown context for many Indian students who in their history classes had only studied the partition on the West. Before I started Tagore's text, and the repercussions of that partition then made poignant sense in Ghosh's novel about the glass border between India and Bangladesh, a shadow line that divided the East and West Bengalis politically, but could not do so culturally and emotionally. There is another shadow line in the novel too, that between Calcutta and London, or India and England, a line not akin to an umbilical cord that is the one that connects the two erstwhile Bengals, but born out of the historical encounter of colonialism that pulled London into the imagination of the colonized well into post-colonial times. Historically, it may be said that modernism came to Indian literature along with the West, and for all the movement's universal definition as new, remained in continued conversation with Western modernisms even as it chalked its own highways and byways in independent India in its varied afterlives. I therefore usually teach Indian modernisms in conversation with the Western, exploring spirit, content, and significant questions of form and style, as well as in multiple conversations between the vernaculars in India. Indian writing in English is particularly a child of Western modernism in an obvious way, of course, but equally a sibling of vernacular Indian modernisms. In discussing Indian modernisms in class, I like to put these conversations into play, I cluster texts across IWE, Indian vernacular, and Western high radical modernist movements to generate these discussions. And what I believe emerges from our classroom conversations about these conversations can both perform and enhance a perception of Indian modernisms as we encounter them. 
However, for the rubric of this seminar, I will focus on Indian writing in English when I discuss texts. Though I would like to keep my particular framing of the three together alive as a background to this presentation. This framing is important to the way I think about modernisms through certain key words. Uh, yeah. uh, event, encounter, and entanglement, in tandem with individualism and isolation, connection and combat, contingency and hazard, dream and desire, failure and death. These make up the tangle, and many others, of course, um, that is modernism, a movement in keeping with the historical upheavals of the 20th century, colonialism, anti-colonial resistance, and the world wars being paramount, that make it impossible to map it along any single axis. In our context, a literary or aesthetic production that marks a departure from everything that precedes it is an event. Gilles Deleuze spoke on the concept of the event at a lecture on March 10, 1987, uh, 1987 uh, that has been reported in these words. Every event is revolutionary due to an integration of signs, acts, and structures through the whole event. Events are distinguished by the intensity of this revolution rather than the types of freedom or chance. In the preface to the English translation of Nietzsche and philosophy, Deleuze answered the question, which one is beautiful, in these words. The one that does not refer to an individual, to a person, but rather to an event. That is, to the forces in their various relationships to a proposition or phenomenon, and the genetic relationship that determines these forces. Power. It is within this understanding of the event of the intensity of the revolution, of beauty in the forces of the various relationships individuals have to phenomena, that one may try to understand the arrival and effects of modernism anywhere in the world, including India. This year, 2022, has been hailed as marking a centenary of modernism in a way, since it was in 1922 that many key texts of high modernism were published, including T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, James Joyce's Ulysses, and Virginia Woolf's Jacob's Room. It must also be said, however, that it was a year in which many texts of modernism, both high and low, Western and non-Western, did make an appearance, and they all contributed to the birth of a movement. Though many were unsung and even unheard of, they were all revolutionary, to use Deleuze's term, for their intensity and their originality of experimentation. Wolf herself had demarcated December 1910 as the year in which human character changed, which is a quotation we all uh, know, uh, with the inauguration of the first post-impressionist art exhibition. And it has often been cited as the year that modernism began. Clearly, these dates are symbolic merely, as aesthetic movements cannot be born on a single day or even month or year. It is enough to conclude that all over the world, the beginning of the 20th century heard the revolutionary rumble of modernism in art and literature. In the event of literature, Terry Eagleton sees all literary work, from novels to poems, as a strategy to contain a reality that seeks to thwart that containment, and in doing so, throws up new problems that the work tries to resolve. The event of literature, Eagleton argues, consists in this continual transformative encounter should I continue? Okay, so I'll stop, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the event of literature, Eagleton argues, consists in this continual transformative encounter, unique and endlessly repeatable. One of the characteristics of the modernist movement globally was the emergence of communities of writers and artists who worked together, sometimes in harmony, but also in rather productive dis discord and disagreement. We know of the well-known Bloom Bloomsbury Group in London, the imagists around Ezra Pound in Paris, and Gertrude Stein Salon for avant-garde writers and artists also in Paris. In India, too, 
both in the vernaculars and in writing in English, groups and communities were formed organically around common concerns and with shared aspirations of writing and publishing. In India, many of these groups were formed out of shared political concerns. For of course, early modernism coincided with the nationalist movement for India's independence from British rule. Like the Progressive Writers Association, uh, we all know of with famous Urdu writers Sadat Hasan Manto and Ismat Chuktai. In independent India, there were numerous groups of writers in the vernacular languages who spearheaded well-known little magazine movements in languages like Marathi, Bengali, Hindi, Gujarati, and uh, many others. In his essay, Our Modernity, Partho Chatterjee writes, uh, my subject is modernity, but more specifically, our modernity. In making the distinction, I am trying to point out that there might be modernities that are not ours, or, to put it another way, there are certain peculiarities about our modernity. It could be the case that what others think of as modern, we have found unacceptable, whereas what we have cherished as valuable elements of our modernity others do not consider to be modern at all. He goes on in this essay then to examine the socio-historical writings of um, the Bengali writer Rajnara and Basu against inferences from Kant and Foucault, uh, finally concluding that since Indian modernity is the modernity of the once colonized, our attitude to it cannot but be deeply ambiguous. An uncertainty that stems from a sense that our modernity cannot ape the colonizer's modernity, but frame itself in a rejection of it. Chatterjee is, of course, talking about modernity and our sociological and historical sense of it, and not modernism, which is a movement of the arts that is defined by certain universal characteristics, even as we talk of modernisms in the plural today. In the arts and in literature, which is our focus today, uh, Indian modernism is a complex beast for being both a carrier of some of the universal markers of the, of the aesthetic movement uh, that is global, as well as an instigator of a political resistance to the Western or its colonizers' demarcations of modernism at large. So Indian modernism or modernisms as uh, they played themselves out needed difference and distance to shape itself both in conversation and in confrontation with the Western model before it. And so this is really the argument that I you know, try to, uh, to look at when, um, when I put these texts together from various, uh, you know, from Western um, and Indian and vernacular um, uh, and Indian writing in English, that, uh, that it cannot be one or the other. You know, it cannot be just uh, an inspiration that one follows nor can it be just a resistance without taking on some of the characteristics, because then it would have to be something else. It could not be modernism, uh, right? Because that is already an established movement. So, so there is this, this kind of confrontational, combative, inspirational, uh, all these elements make up um, uh, what is Indian modernism. And I think it makes it more interesting and fascinating because of that. It may be said that the early Indian writers in English tended to be isolated, not sharing locatedness or a politics, but fulfilling individually the task of making some aspect of India's emergence as a nation available to the English-speaking world for the first time. Hence the importance of writers like R.K. Narayan, Raja Rao, and Mulkraj Anand, the famous first trio of Indian English, or the diasporic Kamala Markandaya. Writers who shaped India's entry into English fiction as early as in the 1930s. Some of the writing was self-conscious and has become dated, though their historical importance in the chronology of Indian writing in English must be acknowledged. If it is in, in the spirit of modernist literature that we are looking for an Indian English writing, however, it took more time to blossom. And it is only after the you know, 1950s, 1960s, that we find the kind of experimental excess with form and content that would truly qualify as modernist, except for stray work that came earlier. In prose fiction, the novelist I like to introduce in my classes as the first modernist of wild and eccentric style is G. V. Desani for his now forgotten outlier novel, all about H. Hatter. I don't know if you've heard of it or if any of you've read it, which was published in 1948. 
which in fact I first got to teach in an old and later discarded MA syllabus of Delhi University. It is a rollicking read, but an extremely difficult novel to discuss for more than a few classes, since its tricks with language, which distinguishes the novel most, are ultimately repetitious. So, you know, when you talk, start talking about it in class, there's not much you can say after you've talked about the linguistic, you know, kind of acrobatics. Um, the eponymous H. Hattar of the novel is an Anglo-Malay character uh, in search of enlightenment and encounters a series of hilarious adventures on this rocky road to wisdom. As far back as, as in 1951, Desani wrote later, I said H. Hatter was a portrait of a man, the common vulgar species, found everywhere, both in the East and in the West. This trope of the tragic comic hero bumbling around seeking knowledge is a universal modernist figure, from Charlie Chaplin in Modern Times to Stephen Dedalus in Joyce's Ulysses. Desani's novel, full of robust puns and composed almost entirely in a strange pigeon Indian English, is not recognized enough, really, as a precursor to Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children of 1981, particularly for its high energy acrobatics of language. Desani was an original and produced Hatter way before its time, an extravagant experiment in writing Indian English, which was doomed to fail for the very excess that characterized it. And this is to, uh, this too lies at the core of the teaching learning experience of modernism. This ability to see commercial or cultural failures and successes as a necessary check and balance of the movement that drew inspiration and sustenance as much from the idea and stench and presence of degeneration and death as it did from the illumination of a moment of perfection and achievement. Perhaps the first real modernist group of Indian English poets who edified this spirit in their writing was the Clearing House Collective of poets, loosely located in Bombay, though all of them were not in Bombay, um, who got together to publish their own poetry, consisting primarily of names you would have heard of, Adil Jas Jasawala, G.F. Patel, Arvind Krishna Malhotra, and Arun Kulatkar later joined by Dilip Chitre, H.O. Nazareth, and Jayanta Mahapatra, who can definitely be identified as asserting an Indian urban modernist sensibility, simultaneously collective and singular. So this again was a modernist trait, right, in, in all the groups that, that we see in very many parts of the world, that they are very, you know, they, they have their singular identity and then uh, they, they come together as collectives. Modernist women poets wrote from their own cultural and intellectual positions that were distanced, were more distanced from each other. Eunice D'Souza was perhaps the only poet to be seen as part of the influential Bombay group of poets in English, though she was not of the Clearing House Collective. Two poets I, I teach as avant-garde modernists are Kerala's Kamala Das, who wrote so evocatively of summers in Calcutta, though, uh, and the diasporic Suniti, uh, Suniti Nam Joshi, right? a poet of feminist and lesbian fables. In my opinion, the range of Indian English poetry in the decades of modernist afterlives has been stunning, something that cannot be matched by Indian English writing in any other genre, including the novel, though the novel is more popular and, and, and well known, I guess, because you know less, less number of people read poetry necessarily. Um, Adil Jasawala, in his collection of writings, um, uh, uh, of writings from 1962 uh, 62 to 2015, um, which was titled, I Dreamt a Horse Fell from the Sky, uh, published in 2016, um, uh, writes of inflections on the sound and meaning of words for rain in different Indian languages. He says, take the word rain, there's a quality in English rain, a unique insufficiency of the energy that is in the Hind Hindi word barsat. The Marathi word paus, on the other hand, strangely close to the English word piss, suggests an almost miraculous linguistic affinity until we realize that Marathi, and I, I wouldn't uh, would dare uh, try and pronounce this word, paus salare, uh, with its attendant slapping of sandals on the pavement and stark vision of a disemboweled umbrella, 
with, with really heavy rain, of course, can find no adequate expression in, oh dear, it's pissing. Right? Um, only a poet can, of course, make poetry in English out of a paragraph that decries the impossibility of that very language to convey the depth of one's cultural experiences. Perhaps, he suggests, it is only a local language that can capture its true colors. And yet, Indian English poets and poetic and maverick writers of prose like Arundhati Roy have managed to achieve this in their sculpting and reshaping of the English language to suit their own ears, fingers, tongues. How have they pulled it off, this capturing of our modernity, as Partha Chatterjee had put it, in the language of India's historical oppressors, without making it conform to their modernity? Ironically enough, by deploying the master's tools, but by twisting it into unrecognizable shapes, First, Audre Lorde had famously said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. But she had perhaps not taken into consideration the possibility of a more devious subversion in which the master's tools, if we think about language, uh, of, uh, of the original language, are used and so infused culturally and politically that they become irretrievably in their original form and metamorphose into formidable utterances of their own. To explore the possibilities of this formulation of Indian modernist resistance, subversion, and reconstruction, I will do um, a, a brief closer reading of some poems of one of the clearinghouse poets, Arun Kulatkar whose art has been described by one of his sharpest critics and readers, Anjali Nerlikar, as a disobedient poetics, disobedient poetics. On the west coast of India in the old and very colonial city of Bombay from the fertile 1960s and 70s, uh, Arun Kolatkar, poet in Marathi and English, graphic design artist and aspiring singer, traced his disobedient poetics in broken staccato fragments that bring James Joyce's prose poetic Anna Livia Plurabel uh, of uh, section of Finnegan's Wake or Gertrude Stein's rhythmic poems uh, like her poem on Picasso to mind. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, so, so that uh, quote first, you never know it, then yes, I guess, I guess, but you don't realize it. You know, this repetition and, and uh, writing without cadences. Mm, um, uh, Kolatkar was an avant-garde modernist, as many of the clearinghouse poets were, and the movement was an avant-garde one. He was an overreacher like all avant-gardists, unsatisfied and searching. His constant foraging in two languages yielded rich results in creative work and a number of awards and other recognitions, but he was never at ease in any of the multiple creative skins that he wore lightly, irritably, and disobediently. Kolatka wrote concurrently in Marathi and English and had a strong sense of himself as a writer in the world of other writers, both local and global. So in a fragment in the Kolatkar papers, a collection of his unpublished drafts, the speaker of the poem locates himself amongst the world's best known writers in English. It's up there. I was born the year Hart Crane killed himself, nine years after Ulysses was burned, three years after Auden published his first collection. However, this knowledge of his contemporaries in the world of English poetry brought him neither confidence nor hope. What it did surely offer him was more ways of occupying the English language as the outsider he was. Despite the cosmopolitan urban landscape he lived in and the company he kept among the clearinghouse poets of Bombay through the late decades of the last century. Kolatkar's Jejuri, you must have heard of it, was one of the best known collections of Indian English poetry in its early heydays. And despite the variety of tone and mood in its poems, vividly refracts the fractious quality of avant-garde poetics in its self-conscious keenness to resist any kind of expectation, either in content or in style. As Leticia Jetzekini, another fine Kolatkar scholar, constructs it, 
he steps out of the frame in order to change his perspective, which could well be a metaphor for delirium, what Gilles Deleuze has called a minoritization of literature. One of the most striking poems in Jejuri destabilizes, um, yeah, can you go to the next? Uh, destabilizes one's perception of a doorstep with a visual reorientation, with the confidence of one who sees and knows differently. It is a four-line poem, merely. This is the whole poem. Uh, of which the first two lines set out the proposition and the second two add what could be thought of as unnecessary emphasis unless one speculates that it must have a purpose. So the poem reads, that's no doorstep, it's a pillar on its side. Yes, that's what it is. And the poem is called The, Sto the Doorstep. So it speaks to Zakini's reading when she says, his poetry privileges the, the odd angle, the peripheral and the eccentric, the out of place and out of frame. And then she says, Kulatkar's aim is to unsettle and estrange. He dislodges comfort by instability, belonging by errantry, permanence by impermanence, and the, and the compactness of identity by the disturbance of alterity. However, Zekini goes on to nuance the remoteness of the poet from his object of poetry. She says, more than outsidedness, perhaps, I would suggest that the trope of in-betweenness as the specific combination of wandering and fixation, nearness and remoteness, outsidedness and insidedness, which is crystallized in the figure of the stranger, is characteristic of Kulatkar. In Zakini's differentiating between outsidedness and in-betweenness lies the paradox of complete freedom and a certain rootedness. Because if you're completely outside, then you don't have any roots in you know, what you are outside of. But if you're in between, then you have some connection, right? Um, uh, where breaking out entirely is an impossibility, and it is in the hanging between the in, in, uh, hanging between that a certain intransigence lies. Yes, that's what it is. So that is the, the you know the meaning of this repetition, which seems unnecessary in the in the last two lines of a four-line poem. Kolatkar is not being confidently contrarian when he makes a quadruple assertion of what contradicts the logical perception of the doorstep. First, by stating that it is not a doorstep, despite the poem's title. Second, by positing that it is a pillar lying on its side instead. Third, by the singular yes. Fourth, by reiterating what he has claimed it is instead. In the many repetitions of his proposition, he is planting doubt even as he makes an apparently immovable claim. This is the in-betweenness that reveals a strange vulnerability beneath the complete outsider's immaculate confidence. Repetition is a staple of avant-garde bravado from Joyce to Gertrude Stein, and in it, what is intransigent is not the doggedness of assertion, but the tremor of uncertainty. For it reveals knowledge that the claim has cracks through which the light comes in. Knowing that what one is asserting repeatedly is not true, and still asserting it, is the most delirious and the most poetically delicious sign of intransigence that the avant-gardists often wear on the sleeves of their very cryptic verse. There is a combativeness embedded in much of Kulatkar's poetry which remains banked, wary, almost like an animal circling its prey without being sure of its power to retaliate. In some poems, however, it spills over, uh, the next one, uh, as in Malkham, literally a wrestler's pole, in which he boasts of his strength to withstand assault through the extended metaphor of wrestling, um, where he is the metal pole upon which the wrestler expends his physical aggression. So these lines, you know, I've, I've just taken sections of um, what is a longer poem. Come climb on me, go right up all the way to the top, etc. Um, the staccato sentences mimic the breathless challenges a, restless, uh, a wrestler may utter in the throes of an encounter with a competitor. But here the I becomes the inert pole, which is much used and abused in the name of sport. Have you done your worst? 
And yet here I stand, the same as ever I was, unshaken and firmly rooted to the ground like an exercise pole in an Indian gym. But an exercise pole made of steel, shall we say? There is a note of defiance and counter-aggression in the poem that deliberately recreates the world of, of wrestling or you know, some kind of um, uh, uh, combative sport, uh, and one in which he establishes the immovable strength of the pole before a throwaway final couplet in which he airily offers the wrestler some reprieve. And if nothing else, I, at least I hope you had a good workout. The poet impersonating a wrestler's practice pole is steely in his monologue addressed to the one he seems to have no interest in aiding, despite the fact that it is his reason for, for being, um, and with whom he establishes instead a position of combat, as if he is assuming the role of the adversary of the wrestler. This then is a double shift, first to the wrestler's inanimate practice pole, and then to his competitor. Whichever we wish to identify him with, identify the poet with, he emerges the vanquisher by the end of the poem, who carelessly throws his opponent a crumb of a good workout, in effect merging the two voices that he assumes. Kolatkar, also in, signature, uh, in other signature experiments, strayed at odd moments into playing with visual effects of the alphabet, words and lines on his page, gesturing affirmatively at what the Cubists and Dadaists, uh, if you know of the, you know, we all know of the movement of Cubism and Dadaism, right, saw as one of the most effective ways of capturing the topsy-turviness of language and thought. In that affirmation, he thumbed his nose at the rule books of writing poetry and introduced, playfully and visually, the sense of incompliancy that nestles at the core of of modernist and definitely of avant-garde uh, modernisms. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this is a, a quote from a long poem called "Between Jejuri and the Railway Station," um, and the initial uh, uh, lines kind of set out the the rural picture. The, you know, uh, as as the train moves. Um, uh, as, as the poet moves, what has stopped you in your tracks, taking your breath away is the sight of a dozen ox and hens in a field of jowar in a kind of harvest, da harvest dance, the craziest you've ever seen, where seven jump straight up at least four times their height as five come down with grain in their beaks. So he's, um, uh, he's trying to create this visual picture first through description, and then what he does in these lines below, which I've actually not been able to do exactly um, what he did on the page, I mean, I've tried to indicate it by these arrows, um, up, uh, up arrows, but what he's done is actually placed the letters up and down. Um, right, so, um, uh, so it ends up, you know, actually mimicking on the page uh, the movement of what, the movement that he's describing of the, the hens and cocks jumping up and down in this, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the craziest harvest, harvest dance. So Kolatka's deployment of playful, ironic, satiric, cryptic, humorous tones to dismiss phony re religiosity, and that's the, the content of the poem, and its endless rituals has been repeatedly noted. And Jejuri, which is a collection of, of poems, short and long, it has often been compared to Eliot's The Wasteland for its creation in word images of an entire universe that has gone to seed. The short poem, Makarant, cons yeah, the next one, please. Um, contains uh, uh, the explosive element of this resistance in Kolatkar, whose set of poems is, however, obstinately iconoclastic rather than sustainedly mournful like, uh, like Eliot's. So this is the entire poem. Uh, take my shirt off and go in there to do puja? No thanks. Give me the matchbox before you go in, before you go, will you? And that's the entire poem. In his insistence on enjoying a smoke outside the temple, where he is expected to enter it to pay obeisance to the gods, which he refuses to do, Kulatkar quietly and almost naughtily rests his resistance to social norms imposed by a closed society. Modernism demands that we allow ourselves an unfetteredness to think about form and structure, about words, images, signs, and their multiple shifting meanings, 
to follow the aesthetic imagination as it soars to fantasy and dives to despair and murder and death, and to see in these acrobatics a difficult and complex politics. Through language, madness and negation, pleasure, ethics and politics, profanation, labor and flannery, pleasure, precarity, tragedy and revolution, via thinkers and artists, theory and praxis, form and situation, Modernist literature identifies signals which bring passionate charge to the ingestion and interrogation of lives and texts in styles and forms that apparently contradict or upend that passion by becoming cryptic, resistant, and silent. Modernisms offer us the opportunity to closely study structure and form and content while resisting structure and form and content. Right? It's, it's constantly undercutting and subverting as, as it goes along. Its politics lies in the aesthetics of non-conformism and the non-conformism of aesthetics at once. Poet Suniti Nam Joshi, Indian-Canadian lesbian feminist fabulist, who embodies the modernist spirit in her experimental poetry and prose, roams the beastly world for uncanny revelations about inhuman meetings, partings, and desires, and writes, yeah. uh, in the forest, both Fawn and I lose ourselves. I want to go back to that lost forest where me metaphors mix, rub shoulders with each other, and everything turns to everything else. And in fact, Nam Joshi was writing well before, you know, post-humanism and the Anthropocene um, actually became categories of, of, uh, of uh, theoretical and critical interrogation. Um, so, but, uh, but uh, uh, she speaks of and with a desolation that perhaps only poetry can bring to imperiled life and love. She speaks about language that then tells us about living and dying at that still point where metaphors mix. These are rarely, uh, there are rarely any affirmations or subtractions, as Alan Badiou would call them, that survive, and yet the poem holds. Such is the treacherous edge that modernism teaches us to walk on. Kamala Das, Malayali English poet, embraced her sexual self to talk about the passions of language um, in, in poetry in her well-known poem, Introduction. This is uh, kind of the first half of it. I won't read all of it. it. It can stay up for a bit. I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power, etc. But these lines have been quoted very often. I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. Don't write in English, they said. English is not your mother tongue. And then she, and this is a poem. Why not leave me alone, critics, friends, visiting cousins? Every one of you, why not let me speak in any language I like? The language I speak becomes mine, its distortions, its queernesses, all mine and mine alone. And this is, of course, as you know, an argument that is, uh, you know, right from Shakespeare's Tempest, uh, you know, Taliban saying, um, uh, I take your language and then, you know, I learn to, to, um, uh, to swear in it, um, etc. This is, uh, this is uh, you know, an argument I think that has been... Uh, maintained and, and, and put up by, uh, you know, most, uh, lots of uh, lang locations where, uh, where a colonizer's language has, um, has taken root. Uh, uh, das, who lived a controversial and intensely passionate life, is doing something else here that is quint quintessentially modernist, though, besides voicing her indignation at being reprimanded for writing in an alien tongue. She is, in her poetry, adopting the cadences of her native speech and, and uh, uh, speaking in breathless phrases separated by commas, inserting reported speech and rhetorical questions, allowing a distance to emerge between formal English and the native speech-flavored language that she naturally adopts in her fervent exclamations. So even as she mounts this argument, the form that she does it in also subverts the, the language, uh, the literature that, that she has inherited. In doing this, she is asserting her own singular deployment of the colonizer's language, which she has bent to her own will and pen. 
In my final section, I want to read uh, a few parts of a short essay that I had written uh, some years ago um, after Arundhati Roy's second novel was published, which became an epilogue, um, epilogue for my book, um, The Audacity of Pleasure. I want to end with Roy because I think she may be the last of those embodying the, embodying the modernist afterlife in Indian writing in English one who embodies all its confusion, its passion, its recalcitrance, its tumultuous affair with words and their sounds and secret meanings, its ability to be both political and erotic and aesthetic at once. Readers either hate or love uh, Roy's novels, right? Very few are indifferent to her. Uh, this to me is a quintessential response that modernisms elicit just by being what they are. They cannot be ignored. Um, the, the essay that I will read from, my own essay that is, uh, uh, was called, was titled A Fragment on Grave Pleasures, and grave is, is uh, a, a pun on the location of uh, her second novel, uh, The Ministry uh, of uh, Utmost Happiness, which is uh, located in a graveyard, um, and I will read just a few parts of it. It is surely poetic justice that the Ministry uh, of Utmost Happiness finds one of its significant viable, diable locations in a graveyard, and that phrase is, of course, from, uh, from her earlier novel. It is also fitting, perhaps, in retrospect, that Amu, lustrous protagonist of the first novel, had died at the not old, not young age of 31 for her unviable love for the god of small things, and that it was Rahel and Esther, Amu's dizoigatic twins, Returning briefly at the end, also age 31, this is talking about God of Small Things, who surprised the novel with incest and survived. In a peculiar way, it seems to me, the momentary coupling of the adult twins at the last breath of the first novel, not in happiness but hideous grief, remains suspended just beneath the skin of the second novel as it gestated and fomented. And each and other, a girl and a boy, grew up to break all the love laws all over again, just like their beloved mother, Amu, and yet in a vitally different way. Happiness, pleasure, grief, death, and survival have met and parted, survived and succumbed, like waves returning relentlessly to a shore in the chasm of time that has yawned between. As Roy has grown in the 20 years between her two novels, walking with comrades, running foul of the powerful, treading dangerous realms in fact, fiction, and rhetoric, they coalesce in the ministry, taking forms that no longer rely on serial transgressions and small belligerent gods, but beginning to embody them. Now the binaries are broken between genders as much as between conflicting ideas of home and happiness, and a tingling awareness that all boundaries must collapse among, but not into, tombs seeps out of this novel like a secret pleasure among failure and pain, to wet our fingers even as we hold it and read it. Failure, writes Judith Halberstam in her book, The Queer Art of Failure, goes hand in hand with capitalism. A market economy must have winners and losers, gamblers and risk takers, con men and dupes. This hidden history of pessimism can be told in a number of ways, I tell it here as a tale of anti-capitalist and queer struggle. This is Albert Stam's book, uh, Queer Art of Failure. This could be Roy's failed and fruitful, both failed and fruitful attempt in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness to recount a tale of anti-capitalist queer struggle in an aspiring market economy poured into a conservative and heteronormative mold. Halberstam goes on to chalk mark a space for this endeavor that could be their shared manifesto. Uh, Halberstam writes, I tell it also as a narrative about anti-colonial struggle, the refusal of legibility and an art of unbecoming, not becoming, but unbecoming. This is a story of art without markets, drama without a script, narrative without progress. The queer art of failure turns on the impossible, the improbable, the unlikely, and the unremarkable. It quietly loses, and in losing, it imagines other goals for life, for love, for art, and for being. So pleasure now lies in other goals, those that have stepped off the bandwagon. 
There is both innocence and experience in such a pleasure. There is bewilderment and excitement and solitariness. And in this art that makes failure a necessary bend in the road, there are clear portents that what we now have here will not quite subscribe to the novel form that we may expect. If The God of Small Things was a novel that experimented with the English language as much as with breaking love laws, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness is an anti-novel, I suggest, that experiments with the prose genre of telling a story because it is more than a story. It is a lived politics of dyads and dead ringers that not only cannot be narrated as a trajectory of events, but must also continually jump on and off the fiction trail. Like a sharp-eyed rebellious child who wishes for both imaginary escape and grim truth at once and is precocious enough to straddle both. Here is an anti-novel then in the spirit of Carol's Alice, who is Carol's Alice, or Desani's Hatter, but leached of the glee of their mirror images and linguistic pirouettes. We have, after all, been there, read that. In the ministry, tiny pleasures are inserted into the dour and dank of everyday skirmishes so skillfully and so tenderly that they are almost unrecognizable, while threads of penury, death, and mourning hang over them remorselessly. It is not for nothing that Hijra Anjum and her chamar home and graveyard sharer Dayachand, who christened himself uh, Saddam Hussein to signal his killer ambitions, enter into the funeral parlor business. This is, of course, the center of, of the story of the ministry. After all, death must be defied in every way possible, not least by facilitating a pretty end. And yet there is the unreality of holding on to each other that keeps life still faintly lit in the grayness of every dawn. Uh, so there are these two quotes here from ministry. Once you've fallen off the ledge, like all of us have, including our Biru, Biru Anjum said, you will never stop falling. And as you fall, you will hold on to the other falling people. The sooner you understand that, the better. This place where we live, where we have made our home, is the place of falling people. Here there is no hakikat. Are, even we aren't real. We don't really exist. Perhaps there is a whisper here of what Lauren Berlant has called cruel optimism. In scenarios of cruel optimism, we are forced to suspend ordinary notions of repair and flourishing. Knowing how to assess what's unraveling, there is one way to measure the impasse of living in the overwhelmingly present moment. Then the other quote, when the sun grew hot, they returned indoors where they continued to float through their lives like a pair of astronauts defying gravity, limited only by the outer walls of their fuchsia spaceship, pink, right, um, with its pale pistachio doors. It isn't as if they didn't have plans. So when we discuss Indian modernisms in the classroom, I like to layer our exposure to the movement by moving between different mediums of the arts, as I said at the beginning, particularly between literature and in, in English and vernaculars in translation, and between literatures and writing at large, which includes the non-fictional, as so much of modernism is to be understood through its manifestos, its memoirs, its correspondences, and of course its essays and critical writings and film and theater scripts. And then between writing in all forms, and cinema and painting and photography, because modernism is one movement that, besides the Renaissance perhaps, connected all the arts in multiple registers, so much so that most of the modernists were skilled in more than one medium. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore was probably an epitome of this, poet, songwriter, novelist, short story writer, essayist, painter, singer. And all of them moved seamlessly between many mediums as they conceived and executed their art or arts. So in some sense, even while I've tried to bunch together an array of thoughts, fairly scattered, about teaching modernisms, keeping the focus on Indian writing in English here, I would be dishonest if I did not flag the other translated cinematic and visual arts material that we would discuss in order to harness a small understanding of the vast and unwieldy movement that modernism is or modernisms are. Thank you. Okay, question.
questions from the audience? Could be comments. It doesn't need to be questions because you, I mean, all of us do have various uh, readings, right? In modernism, it may not be these ones, but you've read others, so you, you can make comments as well. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, my question was fairly short. Uh, in Kolakta's Jejuri. Is his subversion of, of tradition, so to say? Because there are several poems, like the one which you uh, quoted, uh, where he, in, in many senses, he, he refers to the uh, to place of pilgrimage in Maharashtra, right. in modern Maharashtra, where there are cracks in the rocks and so on, in the other poems of the, of the collection. So is his subversion of, of received religion or, or of tradition uh, an evidence of, or a feature of his modernity or his modernism? More than modernity is his modernism. I think so, right? I mean, I think so. That uh, uh, and the the interesting thing, though, is that he, despite a very strong repudiation, you know, like that smoking those lines, right, saying that I'm not going to go in and perform puja, I'm going to smoke outside uh, instead. Um, but he does it in this very intimate, light, you know, almost loving kind of way, like uh, you know, we we dis sometimes dismiss or discard. Um, things that maybe our family members tell us, grandparents, etc. Right? That there isn't a rancor, you know. There isn't this this kind of uh, there isn't a hatred, which I think is is the difference today in some senses, you know, as as the politics of of religion and and you know social and community living has evolved. Uh, that the the modernists in their writing they were constantly iconoclastic, right? And and religion would always be. Uh, the one target because, of course, uh, in some senses, modernism or modernity, uh, in fact, questions this, this kind of um, uh, unthought allegiance to rituals and, and, and beliefs and, and um, um, uh, superstitions and all of that. And Jejuri, in fact, made such an impact because of that. Because, but because he did it in such a light way, in, in a kind of storytelling fashion, and uh, you couldn't you know, you, even those who would say decry or look down upon this young person who says, I'll sit outside and smoke instead, cannot actually, you know, go and hit him on the head, right? Because he does it in, 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 so I think that is also a modernist sensibility in some sense and also a stylistic thing that, uh, that they tried, right? Where, where the language uh, in its brevity and, and in its uh, in its light and also its its day to day kind of quality that it just seems like one other conversation that's happening it doesn't seem to be of huge import that somebody is going to break down a, a temple or uh, you know uh, something like that so so yes I think definitely you know that is what he's trying to do but uh, but but the form in which he does it I think is is also uh, modernism right in in in, in uh, a different kind of way. Um, so you started by talking about how Indian modernisms uh, are the mo Indian modernism is the modernism of the ones colonized, and how um, you talked about the progressive writers' movement and how it is also based in the political struggle against colonialism. I was wondering how. Uh, does the relationship of these modernisms with the Indian nation, how does that shift? Because you ended with a Roy's ministry of utmost happiness and you started with um, the Bombay poet. So I was wondering how that relationship sort of grows and evolves um, to this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, uh, that's, a, that's a really, well, in, in a lot of ways, a crucial question, uh, right? I mean, clearly, as our history has shifted and taken on so many different shapes. There is, I think, that sense of, um, I mean, I think between uh, the progressive writers who were in another kind of political movement altogether and felt that, that pressure, to Roy, who is an activist of today. I mean, she's not just a fiction writer, but she's, a, she's an activist. And also other writers who are writing um, in, in more contemporary times, let's say in this, this century. Um, there is much more of a sense of, 
being beleaguered within the nation. Right, and I think that has impacted modernist afterlives in a, in a different kind of way. So um, while I would say that uh, um, the in-between or, or even you know, some of these writers like Roy, they have kept that, uh, that uh, element of experimentation with writing, right, which is kind of endemic to modernism as, as, we, as we understand it. Uh, they have tried to keep that alive, but on the other hand, you know, with, between her two novels, I mean, there was a lot of um, uh, uh, conjecture before Ministry came out about whether she would redo the experimentation with language that she had done in God of Small Things, right? And, you know, will she be able to repeat it? Uh, how will it be if she repeats it? Because that was a one-off one, one -off thing, and this is now 20 years later, etc. And she didn't try to repeat it. Um, also because, and, and this is why, uh, you know, I've also called it, uh, in my own formulation, in some senses, anti-novel, which is taking from uh, the, the uh, poet Nikonor Para's idea of anti-poetry, that, that you, you know, push against the form also in, in, in some way. So, uh, so I think she tries to bring into ministry, in these 20 years, what has happened in India and what she as an activist has, has, has uh, um, you know, experienced. I think she's trying to bring those strands into, uh, into ministry in, in a different kind of way. So, so it becomes, it goes back, it's interesting because I think the, the in-between years and then by the time now uh, writing in the 2000s, um, uh, it goes back to being uh, uh, historical in, in some sense because there seems to be an urgency to write the novel which will bring in all these multiple strands, uh, et cetera, because it's, lo it's getting lost, right? So, so, and then using tropes like the graveyard uh, and a funeral service, I mean, clearly there's a tongue-in-cheek kind of side to it that, you know, we are at, at the moment of death, but also then finding these colorful characters who will, who will resist. So I think it's very much a part of as you're saying very rightly, I mean, I think the, the experience, the political experience of the last 20, 30 years has begun to color uh, uh, writing in, in a different kind of way. Yeah, yeah I think so. So uh, when we think of uh, the writers in modernism, we think about the cosmopolitan urban space and the identity of the writers as someone beyond borders. So, uh, and as you pointed out, the Indian notion of Indian modernism was both a conversation with and a contestation against the Western ideals of modernism. So how do the writers negotiate between these two identities? When we think of as them as cosmopolitans and as well as a distinctively Indian notion of modernity. Right. It, it reminds me of what uh, Salman Rushdie said, right? That we are all translated beings. Uh, so translated doesn't mean just translating from one language into, into another, but uh, that we are constantly negotiating two different spaces, right? As, as a translator does, that you have an original language and then you have a target language, so you're moving between them and there is there is hope in that, there is you know, a certain confidence that you can pull it off, uh, but there is no sense of stability in one or the other. Right, and, and I think all of us in different ways, I mean, maybe the, in different generations feel it in, uh, in you know, different kind, uh, sets of experiences, but I think there has been much of a sense in, in a lot of the post colonies, India is, is uh, one of them, uh, that with the experience of, of colonialism. It is not something that you can either wish away or discard, right? So I remember that, you know, all those, uh, those um, um, conversations about whether post-colonialism is after or whether it actually includes colonialism in it, right? Because there wouldn't be a post-colonial if there wasn't a colonial. So can you just say, okay, 1947 and that's it, you know, for India? But of course not, because uh, the post-colonial uh, the, the impetus was there, you know, some decades before that, and then there are colonial impacts carrying on. So, so I think this mixture, you know, the 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 one that Nam Joshi calls uh, "let the metaphors mix," um, is so endemic to our 
national character, if you like, even without you know generalizing and uh, uh, homogenizing, because I don't think there is one national character. But if there is one element that is you know true of of uh, of the post colonies at large or India, it is this sense of a slight an instability in occupying one position or the other, and therefore, in some senses, sometimes moving between one and the other, sometimes trying to find a middle ground, a third position, right? So the mixed metaphor is a good metaphor, I think, in, in some senses, right? That, uh, that we can understand what the mixed metaphor does, and yet we are unsettled by it because it is mixing the images. Uh, so, so I think, but, but I personally feel, because of course, you know, uh, I'm interested in modernism and I, and I, and I like uh, the movement, that I just find that that's a good place to be. I mean, why do we need to be certain and, and sure and, and things like that? I mean, I think it, it allows for a certain kind of creativity uh, that uh, because of this uncertainty and instability and, and a sense of doubt and, you know, always this idea of failure also, you know, Beckett, so, you know, fail and fail better is, is, is what he says. So I think that sense is, is very palpable in modernists wherever they are located. Uh, so, uh, so, so if that answers your, your question, thanks. Hello, ma'am. Hi. Um, you talk about how uh, play, playfulness with style, form, and con content is uh, um, endemic to modernity, modernism. Um, Modern but that time. is a response to a particular time and place. So I want to ask you, how do we define this alternate modernity? And uh, uh, how, how would you define, what was the word you used? Alternate modernity. How would we define them? Because uh, what you call endemic to modernity, is rooted in a particular time and place, particular social, social political condition. No, I, I mean, what I was saying was endemic, was stylistic. And in terms of form, the, the fact that we think about modernism as a movement that was, uh, you know, playing with form, right? And, and experimenting with style and, and constantly doing that in so many different ways. And alternate modernities or other modernities, you know, whatever we want to want to call it, which which is then, of course, pitting it against the, the original Western uh, uh, modernist movement, um, I think is able to do that playing in different ways. Like I was, you know, even the few examples that, that I put, a lot of it is with local color, right, actually using not just local cultural color, but uh, but language you know, inserting uh, local languages and, and, of course, social and cultural mores and, and, and things like that. So providing an alternative, but yet keeping to that idea of playing with style and, and form and content. So, so that, I mean, what is endemic is not what was originally there, which, was, uh, which is a particular, as you're saying, location and, and time, but in fact, destabilizing the location and time through form and with form and, and style. Right. So, so that is what remains a kind of constant that if something is modernist, then it will most likely do an experimentation with, with style and form. Uh, or even adopt a style and form that was already experimental. I mean, it, you know, everybody is not necessarily doing uh, something completely original. But there are trajectories, right? So, uh, uh, so, so this whole, for example, uh, uh, there is this... Um, Dadaism, if you know, as, as, as a movement, right? So um, there is a poem by Tristan Zara, uh, um, uh, an European poet, Zara spelled T-Z-A-R-A, uh, which the poem says how to write or how to make, I forget, a, a Dadaist poem. And then he gives instructions about how you can produce a Dadaist poem. And he says, you know, go to a newspaper, cut out different sections, Put, put those strips in a bag, toss the bag around, bring them out and place them and that's your poem. So which is what, which, which then is saying what? I mean, other than the fact that sometimes, in fact, if you do that, um, uh, it, you know, I've, I've sometimes played um, uh, a game called Exquisite Corpse. I don't know if you've heard of it, which was an avant-garde um, uh, game that uh, a lot of writers used to play, which was, which is a bit like, um, 
you know, the game that you have, we usually do it in drawing, they used to do it in writing. You know, somebody draws the head and then you fold it and then it goes to someone else who doesn't see the first bit of drawing and you're supposed to draw the next part of the body, the neck, then some folds it, then it goes to a third person and somebody draws the rest of the body. So then you end up, when you open up the picture, you end up with, you know, maybe a duck's head, an elephant's neck, a human body, etc. So, so it's a game, I, I forgot, it has other, it has different names, this game, I forget. But Exquisite Corpse was a, was a game that uh, Andre Breton and, uh, you know, the, the uh, surrealists had invented to play amongst themselves, which was to, uh, you know, you have a single line of poetry and it goes to a next person who just has the, the earlier line to respond to and then a third person who doesn't see the lines before but has, so then a poem is constructed eventually and I've done, we've done this exercise in class often in our modernism class and it's ended up producing amazing, you know, sometimes the poetry actually just falls into place. It's, it's very strange how it, how it does that. So that's one aspect of it that you can actually, you know, throw things together, throw images together, throw ideas together and, uh, you know, produce something that is, um, uh, you know, that makes some sort of poetic sense not perhaps logical, reasonable sense, but poetic sense. But the other also is to, to think about style and form, to push it to these extremes, right? Where, where you don't have any kind of logical pro progression at all, but you can produce a poem through these kind of complete disparate bits of, bits of writing, bits of sentences. Um, so, so I think, I've forgotten where we started. What was the question? What, where did I come from? I forget. I have forgotten. But anyway, so so this is what you know. I, I was trying to say for uh, for the the extreme experiments that one can do with with style, you know, using using language, and and of course, wherever the location is or whatever the time is, it will reflect the language of, and, and the cultural artifacts of the time, right? So if you take a newspaper 30 years ago and you cut it up, then that will have a certain kind of language and news, etc. And if you take today's, it will have a different kind. Right? So that in itself will create a, a distinction in, in location and time, but the, the method of putting something together will still remain the same. Yeah? So, yeah. Uh, hello, ma'am. Thank you for the very uh, nice lecture. I was um, thinking this is kind of I was th thinking aloud. I'm not not sure if th these are uh, structured questions at this point. Yeah. Um, so uh, you started with the Deleuze quote of of an e e event, right? E every event is a revolutionary due to an uh, science. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. So um, so the first thought that came to my mind that uh, as we know, like as like how like Eliot saw modernism, like, like if we can say that the Western idea of modernism is something like, like of an e event where, where like Eliot says in, like, in his tradition uh, and individual talent that the uh, writer has to embody writers uh, from the past and like answer back to them. So in this scenario, would you say uh, the idea of an Indian modernism is is a reaction to that idea of, of a unified event because the ex examples that that you took, especially from I think Kukulakar, they're trying to break any sense of uh, predisposed tradition that can be there in in, in a kind kind of uh, poetic writing, mm. for instance. Mm -hmm. That is number one. And number two, I was thinking uh, in your uh, years of like studying modernism in this country, the context of like India, have you come across any kind of unified module that can be said, that can be defined, um, I don't know, very roughly something called Indian modernism per se? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, sort of, for those questions. It's, um, uh, you know, in, in fact, they, they sort of speak to each other, right? Uh, the two questions as well. And, and I think the, the combined answer, and then we can break it up into both, um, would possibly be that, um, that, that modernism as a movement doesn't, uh, you know, moves away from the unified and the stable, 
right? So even when we are thinking of event, let's say in Eliot's terms, the wasteland is an event. I mean, you know, each any production is also an event. So it was it was that, um, and the idea of a, of an encounter, an event, and an encounter together. Um, what modernists are doing is is are trying to break. They're constantly trying to break the the the, the containedness of an event, you know, that the fact that it's stable and it's certain and etc. Because uncertainty and doubt and all of this is is uh, is absolutely at the at the base of, of uh, modernism, right? So, uh, so so I think that the event does not mean, and I don't think Deleuze was also meaning that that it is something that is. It is, it is, an event is obviously temporal, right? I mean, it's temporarily defined. So event is happening at this moment of time or that moment of time. And once that moment passes, then the event is passed, right? So, so this destabilization, so, so the fact that life is, you know, Wolf said a series of gig lamps, etc. Uh, so in that, again, a series of events. So each lamp and each halo is an event and then you move on and then that is no longer there except in the memory and then of course the modernists, I didn't even talk about that today about how much uh, modernism is to do with memory, right, Proustian and, and all of that. So, um, uh, so that and also then in keeping with this uh, uh, reading of it, uh, I don't think that, you know, there is or there can be, if they are, if they are truly modernist, uh, any Indian, uh, you know, I don't know, writer or group, etc., that uh, would be completely stable and, and look at. Because the whole, then they, then they would be something else. I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't writers who are, uh, you know, possibly who are looking at, at uh, stability and who are trying to find a certain, uh, retrieve a certain kind of certainty and stability, but they probably would not be modernist in spirit then uh, or in style. So, so, yeah, I would think that. I think good, yeah, and thank you, Professor Bose, for that wonderful lecture, and most importantly, for the stimulating exchange with the audience. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you so much.